Hear the word of the Lord, Proverbs 29, verse 2. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. Verse 4, by justice a king builds up the land, but he who exacts gifts tears it down. Verse 8, scoffers set a city aflame, but the wise turn away wrath. Verse 12, if a ruler listens to falsehood, all his officials will be wicked. Verse 16, when the wicked increase, transgression increases, but the righteous will look upon their downfall. And then verse 22, a man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. Lord, let us love your law. Make it our meditation all the day. For it's in Jesus we pray it. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Marlene and I just returned from a trip to Wisconsin to visit our daughter Alex and son-in-law Josh. Uh, they have a house on a two-acre lot that's uh, mainly wooded, and uh, they have a chicken coop, and they have five hens. And uh, one of the days we were there, they were taking care of their hens, and they filled up this big bucket with water and this chemical solution, and one by one they would take a hen out of the coop and plunge it into this bucket, fully submerged except for the hen's head, and they had to keep it in this solution for 60 seconds. And it was to get rid of the ticks on their body and to prevent them from having ticks in the future. And so Josh and Alex would hold that hen down in this bucket, and the hen wasn't enjoying it, and Josh would count slowly up to 60 and finally let the hen loose out in their yard. And as they were going through this, uh, everything was moving smoothly until they got to the last hen. Um, and that was kind of the sound, what it sounded like. <laughs> um, but the name of that fifth hen was Winnie. And it's funny how you always remember the name of the troublemaker. And so they tried to get Winnie, but Winnie was very stubborn, and she wasn't about to get into that bucket. So somehow Winnie got away from Josh and Alex and ran into the woods. And so they are trying to urge this hen to come out of the woods by offering treats. And then finally our daughter Alex had a blanket, and she's coming from behind uh, Winnie, and Josh is waiting uh, for Winnie to come out of the, the woods with his towel. And this went on for about 20 minutes, and finally they were able to capture her and plunge her into that chemical solution. And I thought about that, and I thought, what could be much harder than trying to herd hens and get them to go to the place where you want them to go? And I thought about the presence of evil, that once evil spreads and increases, it is impossible to corral it and lock it up so that it will no longer cause harm. Once evil is let out of its cage, is it possible to place it back in its container? I fear that once evil begins to increase, it is next to impossible to prevent and contain its advance. The verses we have just read warns kings against having an evil influence upon the people under their care. Then if evil is allowed to increase, the harm and destruction that is caused is absolutely devastating. These verses not only apply to government leadership, but applies to leadership in the church, to leadership in our places of employment, to leadership in the home, and even as we think of leading our own lives and how we are to walk in a way that pleases God. The thought is that we do not want evil to increase, 
grow and expand because when it does, it's like that 18-wheeler truck that's going down the side of a steep mountain that loses its brakes, and then we wonder what could possibly be the outcome. How do we stop the spread of evil? First, we will consider the advance of evil, and then we will consider the advance of righteousness. So under the heading, The Advance of Evil, I'm going to share from these verses four ways in which we witness the advance of evil in our world. And first, people groan under a wicked ruler. People groan under a wicked ruler, verse 2. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. We may ask ourselves, why do the people groan under a wicked ruler? Wicked rulers are controlling, they are domineering, they are oppressive. They do not care for the people. They only serve their own self-interest in obtaining wealth, power, fame, and more control for themselves. They use people to serve their own selfish ends, and people suffer under their rule. So the people groan. The word groan means to make a deep, inarticulate sound in response to pain and despair. A groan is inarticulate because the pain is so intense that there are no words to express the depth of agony and despair that one feels. Romans chapter 8 talks about all creation groaning because it is under the curse of sin. But if you read Romans 8, that's a different kind of groaning because it's a hopeful groaning. As creation looks forward to the redemption that will be ours in Christ when Christ returns. No, this is the kind of groaning where there is utter despair and you don't see any hope for a better future. And so you groan. But second, we see the advance of evil in that bribery distorts justice. Bribery distorts justice, verse 4 of Proverbs 29. By justice, a king builds up the land, but he who exacts gifts tears it down. The uh, Legacy Standard Bible says, by justice the king causes the land to stand, but a man of bribes tears it down. So if those who hold the power base their decisions upon the unlawful gifts given to them, then law and justice are no longer the standards that are followed or obeyed. Decisions at the top are now purchased by those who have the means and evil intent to do so. This governing by bribery cuts out the interest and well-being of the citizens as their needs and their concerns are ignored. The benefit belongs to the highest bidder. Justice is replaced by evil influence. And it all begins with a king who is willing to accept bribes. Accept bribes rather than to rule by law and in the interest of the people whom he is called to govern. We see in this verse the consequence of giving and receiving bribes. It says, but a man of bribes tears it down. You see, the land suffers as law and order is replaced by self-centered governing. Then thirdly, we see the advance of evil in that scoffers set a city aflame, verse 8. Scoffers set a, man, scoffers set a city aflame, but the wise turn away wrath. And then verse 22, a man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger cause, causes much transgression. Derek Kidner tells us that this word scoffer appears 17 times in the book of Proverbs. Scoffers have a strong 
disdain for correction. They are deliberate in their troublemaking. The problems they cause are not random, unintended occurrences. In verse 22, we read, a man of wrath stirs up strife. The phrase, stirs up, literally means to blow up a flame. And so this is the idea of someone fanning a flame and causing that fire to rage out of control. The expositor's commentary states, scoffers are men who laugh at moral obligation and stir up the baser passions of their fellow citizens. It makes me think of the riots that occurred on university campuses in the spring. And a lot of those who came to riot were outside the university community. They were the scoffers who took a small, plant, small flame and caused it to rage into a, a mighty forest fire. And it's not to uh, condone the universities themselves as they planted the seeds. And they did nothing to corral uh, what was taking place on their campuses as they were rioting against the Jews and the state of Israel. I think of the great Chicago fire of October 8th through 10th in 1871, and it began when a cow kicked over a lantern in Mrs. O'Leary's barn. And the neighbors came together to try and put out that fire, and they were not having success, so a couple of them ran three blocks away to sound the alarm. And by the time the horse-drawn carriages of the fire equipment showed up, the wind had swept through and was already spreading that fire throughout the city. The damage was unbelievable. More than 300 people lost their lives. 18,000 buildings were consumed, worth about $200 million. One whole section of the city, four miles long and a mile wide, was completely destroyed. Chicago Fire led to better fire alarm systems, better firefighting equipment, new laws for fireproof buildings, and a new high-pressure water system. And it also led to Fire Prevention Week, which takes place, as you might have guessed, that week of October 9th through the 10th, an annual reminder of the terrible Chicago Fire of 1871. Proverbs 29, verse 8 says, Scoffers set a city aflame, and so evil advances. And then a fourth and final way in which we see evil advancing is that falsehood leads to corruption. Verse 12, If a ruler listens to falsehood, all his officials will be wicked. It is true that once we start with the telling of lies, then in order to maintain the story, we must continue telling more and more lies. Expositors states, once a ruler begins to listen to lies, his court will be corrupted. The Romans had a saying, like king, like people. If the political and military officials are loyal to their king who is controlled by falsehood, then all those under him will seek to maintain his false story line. And I think the obvious biblical example is when Eve was deceived by the serpent in the garden that was embodied, uh, the serpent was embodied by Satan himself. And so Satan was able to persuade Eve that God really didn't care for them and that if you just took the fruit from that forbidden tree and ate of it and disobeyed God, then you would be like God, knowing good and evil, and your life would be far better. So Eve was taken in by this deceit. And what strikes me about this is that Adam is standing right next to her and he offers no objection. He doesn't even say, well, let's think about this before we make such a rash decision. Genesis 3, 6. She took of its fruit and ate, 
And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And Adam, as the federal head of all mankind, because he disobeyed this deceitful lie, he plunged the entire human race into the fall of sin and rebellion against our Creator and God. And it all began with listening to a lie. Lies beget more lies that beget more lies. There is no end once falsehood gets underway. And so evil advances. And so how do we stop the advance of evil? How do we begin to see the advance of righteousness? I read an article on Gospel Coalition this week that caught my attention. It's entitled, When Your Neighbor Accepts Christianity as Good But Not True, by Andy Bannister. And Bannister in this article discusses those who call themselves Christian atheists. And I thought you couldn't have two more opposite terms brought together in one phrase, Christian atheist. So what is a Christian atheist? According to the article, Bannister says, these are well-known atheist intellectuals who recently have said that they believe the teachings and values of the Christian faith are good for society, while in their minds they believe its foundational truths are untrue. For example, a Christian atheist would not believe that there is a God or that God created the heavens and the earth. They would not believe that God became flesh and came to earth and dwelled among us in the person of the Son of God. They would not believe any of those things. But they would believe that the laws of the Christian faith, that wisdom literature, that Christians coming together and fellowshipping and loving one another and serving, that that's all good. So, I ask the question, is the Christian life no more than obeying the law of God, living according to godly wisdom, and remaining unstained by the evils of the world? Is that all that the Christian life is? Can we truly be Christian by outward obedience alone, and is this what defines us? Can we be atheist and be genuinely Christian at the same time? You see, the Christian life is not defined by behavior modification. The Christian life is not good advice. It is not good guidance. It is not good instruction. The Christian life is good news. It is the good news of God descending into our world to redeem us by His life, His death, and His resurrection. It is the good news of God indwelling our hearts so that we are transformed from the inside out. It is the good news of what God has done for us in saving us and not what we have done to make our lives better. It is the good news that once we were dead, but now we are alive that once we were lost and now we have been found, that once we were blind and now we see. I was rereading this week Reverend Henry Skugel's work, The Life of God and the Soul of Man. Skugel was a Scottish theologian, minister, and author. He wrote this short book, uh, they believe it was actually a letter to a friend, but he put it in book form in the year 1677, a year before his death. He died at the age of 27. George Whitfield read Skugel's work, and this is what he said. I must be born again or be damned. And through that work, Whitfield was converted to Christian, the Christian faith. Henry Skugel expressed it in these terms. They know by experience that true religion is a union of the soul with God, a real participation of the divine nature. 
the very image of God drawn upon the soul, or in the apostles' phrase, it is Christ formed within us. Skugel continues. Briefly, I know not how the nature of religion can be more fully expressed than by calling it a divine life. Have you ever thought of the Christian faith as a divine life? In other words, we do not make ourselves to be Christians. Rather, to be Christian is dependent upon the divine work of God in us. We are not self-made. We are God-made. The Christian is the miraculous work of of God upon our lives. So how then is righteousness advanced? And I think really Romans chapter 1 verses 16 through 17 has the answer for us. Listen to these words from the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So righteousness is advanced through the gospel. And notice here that the gospel is the power of God. It is not good advice. It is not good guidance. It is not helpful words to live by. The gospel is the power of God that raises dead people. People dead in their sin and makes them new creatures in Christ. And only God can perform this work. And so notice how righteousness spreads and increases. Romans 1.17 For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. It says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. In it, that is, in the gospel. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And this is not the righteousness of our doing or making, but it's the righteousness of Christ that was earned and given to us by Christ's perfect life of obedience while on this earth and received into our lives by faith. Then notice how the righteousness is revealed or spread. It is revealed from faith for faith. I think a better translation is from faith to faith, meaning that this righteousness is spread and propagated from one Christian believer who shares the gospel with another, and then that person receives it and accepts this gospel as their own, and then in turn shares it with another, who shares it with another, and so forth. If you want to see the growth and increase in righteousness throughout the land, the only way is through the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And faith is what attaches us to Christ as we receive all of his benefits of his grace and his goodness. Faith gives us Christ, which itself is a gift of God to us. And so really, we should ask ourselves two questions here. First, do I believe that the gospel is the power of God? And then secondly, am I willing to share this gospel with others? And both of those questions go together, because why share the gospel if it's not the power of God? And so we go forth sharing it with boldness and with courage in Jesus' name. It is difficult to think of winter while we are in the middle of a scorching hot summer, I went to Wisconsin, it was hotter there than it was here. 
But in the Chronicles of Narnia, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, we find a talking fawn, half goat, half man, who describes the land of Narnia as always winter and never Christmas. This is C.S. Lewis' way of saying that we live in a world that is under the curse of sin. It's this way because in the Chronicles, the white witch, who signifies Satan, has taken over the land, and Aslan, a lion, who signifies Jesus Christ, the king, is gone. But later in the story, another character talks about the coming of Aslan, and that one day he will return to the land of Narnia. And that character is a talking beaver. And the talking beaver shares this promise. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bares his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. Christ has come and defeated the white witch. But sometimes it still feels like winter, doesn't it? It is at Christ's return that winter will end and Christmas will arrive. This is our hope. This is our longing. This is our journey's destination. Righteousness shall prevail through the Christ of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Sovereign Lord and Heavenly Father, we fear the spread of evil and the destruction it causes. And so we pray for your gospel to go forth with boldness and power to transform many lives. And we await for your return that will make all things right. We give thanks that the Christian life is more than living according to an ethical code. Rather, it is Christ formed in us as we were once dead in sin and are now alive in your Son. All glory, honor, and praise to you, our King and immortal God. In Jesus we pray. Amen.